Welcome back. Asian American women represent about under 1% of C-suite leadership in corporate America. Our first guest's new book recognizes the unique challenges AAPI women face, including a potential lack of skills in advocating for themselves. Now, the book aims to empower Asian and South Asian women by equipping them with the essential tools needed to become their own cheerleaders and achieve remarkable success. Joining us now to tell us her point of view on this matter is the corporate leadership coach and author of Be Your Own Cheerleader, Nilu Kaur. And thank you so much for being with us, Nilu. Thank Nilo. you for having me. Glad to have you. So we talk about this here, we look at the numbers and we say the numbers definitely don't add up. And when you look at those numbers, what first, what's the first thing that comes to mind? There's a lack of us representing. And right. we have the skills, and we have the intellect, and we have the capabilities to be the C-suite, but we just don't get the opportunities. And when we talk about ethnicity, we talk about demographics such as that, um, under 1%, what could we attribute this to? I believe it's because we're not skilled with speaking up. So what happens for Asians and South Asians, whether we are born in those collective we-based cultures or we are raised by immigrants from those cultures. What happens is Asian and South Asians are very we, so it's collective. So it's all about group harmony, uh, you know, you keep your head down, you just work really hard, and you assume that the work is gonna speak up for itself. And when you come to corporate America, which is very I-based, so North America is very I-based, and so you talk about yourself, your credentials, and when you come from these collective cultures, it's just not intuitive, it's not something we were taught or modeled. And so when we get it to work, it's really challenging for us. So you got some work ahead of you, right? Yeah. So you're out here and you're educating. You're also the author of a book and you're educating on this particular part of leadership. What is it that you want people to know when it comes to this? I feel like my main message is to let women know that they have the resources internally to know when to turn up the we and when to turn up the I. So I like to think of it as like a speedometer in a car. So mm -hmm. on one side is we and one side is I. And for those of us that live and are very comfortable in, in the we, I want us to flex and move towards the I. So I want us to talk openly about our credentials, our accomplishments, all of the things that we do. I think it's very viscerally uncomfortable for those of us that come from collective cultures. And so my message in the corporate landscape is to really help women who struggle with this to speak up and, and advocate. It's hard though, right? When you, talk, when you, when you, when you come from a we, yes. you know, I, I sometimes speak in third person, we, right? Yes. And I do have a hard time sometimes getting to a place of I. I've got some friends that say, listen, you need to say I more often. You need to really talk about what you right. do. It, it becomes a challenge because you become so, you know, you're the servant, if you will. You're, right. You're, and you become used to being that. What's the key in making that transition from we to I? One is self-awareness. So knowing that you have this internal dial, Right, and so when you are in we situations, you talk about shared deliverables, shared outcomes. When you are in I situations, you talk about yourself, your credentials. So for example, when I am in a team and I'm coaching a team or I'm entrenched in an organization, I will use words like our deliverables, our outcomes, shared deliverables, right? And then when you're on the I side, you talk about yourself, your credentials, and for me, that's in sales development or business development calls, I have to talk more about all of my accomplishments. And I think when we have that barometer internally or this dial, we have to know when to navigate between the we and the I. For yourself, obviously, it's been a long journey, right? right. And talk about your journey and, what, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I absolutely suck at self-advocacy. <laughs> <laughs> really? No. Yes, no, I really do. And I think those of us that teach, we right. need what we teach the most, right? right? And so for me, I, re I just remember getting downsized or getting fired. Like I had a series of si downsizing, series of getting fired, and I never knew what it was because I'm a hard worker, I'm really smart, but I kept getting fired or downsized. And so when specifically in 2013, I was downsized from a large company. And I remember when I was escorted back to my desk, I was escorted as if I was a criminal. They were like, you have five seconds or 10 seconds to grab your belongings, and then we have to escort you out of the building. And I looked around and everyone around me was part of this clique. They were white, they were Caucasian, male, we, female, and I just remember thinking, they're part of a group or something, they're doing something I don't know how to do, and I think right. in that moment, I sort of had an aha that they are their own cheerleaders and I just really suck at it. Mm. And so that was sort of the <laughs> onset, that started my journey into figuring out how do I speak up, and then since then, I've helped so many women, thousands of women speak up and self-advocate for themselves. 
there have been benefits though of growing up in a collective culture, right? Absolutely. I mean, so, so what, are, what are the benefits that you take away from growing up in a collective yeah, culture? Yeah, you know, one of the things is we share. We share everything. Right, <laughs> and right. it's, sharing is more comfortable than not sharing. We take care of the elderly. There's a lot of things in, in we-based cultures, much more collective, much more group harmony, and I think that there's definitely great attributes there. I just want us to flex more in the eye if we live in North America. Yeah, but the problem is sometimes people feel as though we, we know too many eye people. Yes. And they're kind of narcissistic, Correct. right? You know? Correct. So you don't want to become that. And the danger is, if I keep becoming this I person, am I am I doing too much? Am I right? So, right. So how do I guard against that? Because that's the internal clock of saying, oh, you know what? I, I don't want to become this person that I resent and I and I and I look at and I despise. I have yet to meet an Asian or a South Asian that's narcissistic in that way. <laughs> like I say, if you're asking me if it's coming across narcissistic, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's that we don't do it, and so just practicing it may feel boastful, but it's something that we must do to excel in corporate America. So for yourself, uh, you take the time of really educating people, and uh, you've authored a book, Be Your Own Cheerleader, right? Um, and sometimes you can't be your own cheerleader because you're spending too much time on the sidelines. Right. So what about the sidelines? What to? How do I get off the sidelines and become that that my own cheerleader. Yeah, I think there's an I in team. Many of us are told that we have to work collaboratively, and that's true, yes, and we also need to share that we've done certain aspects of work, mm -hmm. right? So it's like having that conversation in your performance review, conversation with your manager, just openly speaking about your own individual accomplishments in that team or group deliverable. And it's something that we're just not comfortable doing. Yeah. So we talk about engaging your interruption shield. Yes. I want to get to that. <laughs> yes. so, so explain to our viewers exactly how do you engage and what is engaging your interruption shield? So interruption shields are words or phrases that we use to jump back in conversations. So what happens for Asian and South Asian women is that oftentimes when we're in a conference room, we're getting interrupted. We're not, our, our voices aren't as loud maybe and we get interrupted. So these interruption shields are ways for us to jump back in the conversation because we don't want others to take credit for our work. And that's happened, it's happened so much for me and it's happened to all of the women I've coached where others have taken credit of their work. So interruption shields are words like, if I may, can we circle back to, I just mentioned this five minutes ago, can we circle back to it, right? So these phrases that we can use and the more we use them, the more comfortable we're gonna be in, in using those interruption shields. Yeah. Again, that's very hard, right? Right. And, and I guess somebody would say from this perspective, AAPI culture, why does it become hard? Because you talk about living in a collective culture, and that collective culture teaches us some things, and we carry those things for a minute, and right. sometimes they're just hard to get rid of. I think the reason that it's so hard is because we're taught to keep our head down and just to work hard, and the work will speak for itself, and the work never speaks for itself in corporate America. You have to be able to grab that bullhorn and to really advocate for yourself. What's it been like for you in this in this journey? Because I, here it is, you're talking and you're, you're teaching, you're training, right. right? But then you still have to navigate these spaces, whether it's to do the training or whether or not it's just your own interaction in corporate yeah. America. What's, what's the journey been like for you? It has been challenging and I have my own techniques that I do before getting on a business development call because for me those are the most challenging where I have to speak openly about myself and my credentials. Mm -hmm. So I have a whole routine that I do to prep for those calls and I think I coach all of the women that I work with to do to figure out their own routine or something where, that feels comfortable to them before they get into the room for their performance review conversation or before they're about to get interviewed for a job or a role. So in the words of Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? <laughs> it's, it's working great. I have a thriving practice, so it mm -hmm. is working pretty well. And so for people who come, you know, and take advantage of the work that you're doing, the body of work that you're doing, um, it is a, a way that you can say, hey, I want to improve myself in the area of being able to effectively communicate and also market myself. Are we seeing improvements in the area of people marketing themselves and also corporate recognizing that? I, st I actually don't know from an Asian and South Asian perspective how that's going in, in companies. I just know that there's a lack of us representing, and so mm. I'm here to help those of us that don't know how to speak up and self-advocate. Yeah. And so for yourself, self-advocacy is very important, very crucial. What are some of the don'ts in the self-advocacy world? Like what not to do? Yeah, what not to do. I think, you know, one of the things that happens a lot for Asians and South Asians is we have really amazing ideas and we don't speak up in the moment. So the don't is don't wait for the conversation to be over. Don't wait till the very end of the project when you're about to be finished. It's like step in right in that moment and actually make sure that your manager or those around you know what you what you accomplished to 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 accomplish that goal. Yeah. 
also you talk about beating burnout and thrive, right? Yes. I want to I want to talk about burnout because burnout is real. Yes. I think there's so many people who experience burnout. Uh, and the worst part is when you experience burnout, they don't even know you're burned out. Right. right. <laughs> so, right. But, but talk to me about beat burnout and thrive. So burnout, you know, a lot of us through COVID, we, we're jumping from meeting to meeting. We are not allowing ourselves to really take time to synthesize information. And so burnout is feeling overwhelmed. Burnout is sort of having those Sunday night scaries when you are dreading waking up and going to work the next day or mm -hmm. not even going because we a lot of us don't commute anymore. Right. So. There are signs of burnout, and I think for Asians and South Asians, when you don't speak up, the fact that you're struggling in certain ways, that is a recipe for burnout. So when we talk about burnout, talk to me a little bit more about it, because when we say, like, hey, um, I'll approach it from this perspective, you know, that burnout can sometimes last for a long period of time, right? How do I get off of that place from getting out of burnout? What are some of the things I can do to get out of burnout? I mean, it's so simple, but the one question I always tell all of the people I coach is ask yourself, what do I need in this moment? Because what happens oftentimes is we are, maybe we're not hydrated, maybe we need to eat, maybe we need to not be in a meeting, but we're in a meeting because everyone invited us to this meeting in our group, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really looking in your calendars, figuring out, do I actually need to be in this meeting? And then asking yourself in the moment, how do I get rid of this overwhelm? Do I need to take a break? Do I need to take a walk outside? What are some things that I can do in this moment to really alleviate the burnout I'm experiencing? Yeah. So in the work that you do, you, you deal with a lot of cultural biases, right? right? And helping people to overcome the cultural biases. For somebody who may not know about them, what, what, what are some of those biases that exist? Some of the biases that exist for Asians and South Asians are really around that we're really good in certain things, but not good in other things. So we're supposed to be really good in math and science. I'm one of the Asians that is not good in math <laughs> and science. So the, there's these stereotypes that we're good in certain things, but we're not good in creative things, right? right? We're not good with communication. We're not good with certain things. And I think when you fall into that in organizations, you might get tasked with more of the math and science types of roles, mm -hmm. or you might be conditioned to think that's all you can do. So you might be in engineering. You might be in something that really requires more math and science, but you're actually more creative than you're allowed to really let yourself think. Talk to me about the three components of profitability here. I got this thing, productivity, purpose, and peace. Yeah. Uh, and you speak about this, yes. right? So uh, how, are, how, how do they become profitable, first of all? I think until we can be peaceful internally, we cannot do anything productively. Okay. So we have to first figure out our own <laughs> mental health and mental well-being before we can go out into the world and do anything. Uh, and, and that aligns to our purpose, right? So we're calm, we're centered, we're balanced. We can then go in the world and figure out what our pur purpose is. And then we're going to help either our own businesses or the businesses we consult in or work in thrive and become profitable. So that peace is very important, right? Because I think you can't, you can't get too far without, right. without, the, without, without the peace component. Right. What is the key in that peace component? What do I need in this moment? Yeah. Right? Moment by moment, awareness of what you need. And I know we are all so busy. We're in a rat race. This is hustle culture, especially in New York City. But I think we need to take a step back and really ask ourselves, what do I need in this moment? And it's as simple as that. What's it like for you when you start asking these questions and start driving through with people? Because right. I think, you know, to a certain extent, you're, you're, you're picking, you're, you're, deacon, you're dicking deep in. And sometimes people say, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm really coming to a full realization that Maybe I do need to work on this, or I've been this way, but in order for me to succeed, I gotta make that change. And we know that for so many people, you know, culturally, it's hard to make that pivot. Are you asking me? I'm mean, asking <laughs> you, so do you agree? Yeah, agree. Yeah, I think, I think first and foremost, regardless of what culture we come from, until our mental health is not taken care of, we cannot be out in the world doing productive things. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the goal of everyone, whether you're Asian or South Asian, and all of the audience here that listens, is that your mental health is the most important thing. Yeah. So for people who want to get connected, what do they do to be connected to your book, your work, your workshops? Yeah, so website, neelucor.com. LinkedIn is my most primary source, uh, social media, and then also Instagram. And yeah. you can find my book, Be Your Own Cheerleader, on Amazon. So how long did it take you to write the book? Five years. Really? Yeah, from start to finish. And how much of it was basically like deconstructing and for yourself? Because, you know, you had to look at self in this as well and say, I, I, you know, there's some qualities I had to get out of me. When I was thinking about the book, I thought I wanted this book to encompass who I am. So it's broken into three sections, psychological, spiritual, and cultural. And so those are the three things that make me who I am in the workplace. And so that's what I really, that's, that's the blueprint that I use when I was writing the book. Yeah. So if somebody wants to get a hold of it, how do they go about doing that? Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, all of the places you can grab books. Yeah. 
And for you in the future, what are your future goals and uh, what, do you see, what do you have coming up? In My future business? goals are to take a sabbatical to start book two. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can you yeah. give me an idea what book two is about? I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm too, I'm looking for the I know, yeah. I'm too busy working. I really would like to take a little break from work to, to focus and, and work on my mental health as well and right. focus on book two. So, but you see, book two is definitely in the future. It is, absolutely. Well, Lily, I want to thank you so much for thank being you with so us. Thank you so much. Lily Cora, and I want to let you know, we're taking a quick break. Guess what? She gave you the ways that you can get the book, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, those places, and uh, check her out. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after this.